Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Doctor Who Reviews. And the world is currently on fire. Uh. And uh, we have a, a, a slight change in the uh, in the scheduled program here because uh, the episode that Jerry was going to suggest for us hasn't arrived yet. I wonder the why the fire. mail is delayed. Yeah, is it because oh, the world's yeah, on the fire. World's on um, the fire, yeah. But Cat came to our rescue, in inverted commas, by suggesting an alternative episode. This is Terror of the Vervoids, and to discuss it, I've got my two usual co-hosts. Firstly, to my virtual left, if he were a plant, he'd be a purple pitcher. It's Freezing Inferno. I like purple. It's also the um, it's actually the national plant of uh, of, of Newfoundland. Oh, educational, yeah. educational. Yeah. And to my virtual yeah. right, if she were a plant, she'd be a Virginia creeper. It's cat. That is not the right plant at all. <laughs> See, I can pick up a Virginia in its title. I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, I believe the state plant is the dogwood tree. Yes, but I was making a joke because you live near Virginia. <laughs> I live in Virginia. That's in Virginia. That's not. That's technically near Virginia. Yeah, you can't get much more near to Virginia than Virginia itself. Oh, to be fair, I would have preferred being called a dog rather than being called the Virginia Creeper. So. Yeah, so I was kind of doing whatever I said. Uh, Twenty minutes into this podcast, you're going to hiss and blow us all up. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell That's... which of us actually plays Minecraft now. Uh... It's me. Hmm. Oh yeah, Minecraft. Yeah, I mean, that, you mean that video game that, that didn't actually get made by anybody; it just came from space one day. Uh, no, 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 no. Hatsune Miku made it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. We thought it came from space, but they said that Hatsune Miku was actually the creator of Minecraft. Yeah, exactly. She also beat Triple H and Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 20. And, uh... <laughs> so uh, this is an interesting uh, episode that Cats picked. I yeah, mean, we we thought we thought we she was gonna go to the twin dilemma, but we, we were did. Spared. We did. I was I was kind of dreading the fact that we, we were going to actually um, review the unreviewable episode, but we've uh, we've been spared for that for a little bit while longer. Instead, we have now. Well, after this episode, we will have talked about seventy five percent of the episodes written by Pip and Jane Baker. What's the other um twenty five percent? What followed after this? Uh, yeah, the last two parts of Trial of a Time Lord. Or, well, yeah, well, you, you've kind of stepped into it. it but says yeah, this is screen the... that they were written by a Pip and Jane Baker, but to explain the technicality would be opening Pandora's box to an entire headache revolving Trial of a Time Lord's let's, resolution let's not do that. Let's and behind do the that. scenes drama. So we're, but... let's just say they wrote the twenty five. They they wrote another story and leave it at that. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> We could just leave it at 75%, but, I mean, come on. What 100%? Oh, oh Jesus. We're, we're going to have to get into the trial for this review anyway. We are, even yes. Though, even though, as Kat demonstrated, you, it's not really necessary, which which says a lot. So, um, so uh, fact, people, um, apparently the copy of the Terror of the Vervoids that I had actually was a fan edit where they cut out all of the trial scenes. Yeah. So I was a little bit confused because um, you guys started talking about uh, uh, Valiard. the Valyard. Is that how you pronounce it? Or is it Valyard? Valyard. 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 Whatever. It's British. They pronounce things weird. <laughs> it's not an actual British name, though. I mean, it's it's, it's complete nonsense. Whatever. There's a, a rumour that it means Dr. Lava. But anyways, they started talking about the Valyard and how he had, like, a weird hat on. And I'm like, who the fuck are you talking about? I started off in a ship. And that's when we realized, oh, it, all, it took all the trial scenes out. Yeah. So, to, uh, to give a little context, Colin Baker's second season is the trial of a Time Lord season. And it is this way because his previous season, it was announced that the show was going on hiatus for 18 months. And fandom flipped the fuck out. As you fandom know, tends to how do. dare you? Oh no, the BBC Michael Grade is trying to cancel Doctor Who. And how dare they? And they I mean, rioted they and they protested. They made a shitty single, you know. But Doctor Who eventually would be coming back in 1986. Well, 
sort of. Sort of, sort of, sort of. Well, they cut the episode count, but they didn't actually, like, fire anyone in charge because the BBC in the 80s didn't really give a shit about Doctor Who, so they just, like, let them get on with it, as it were. But thanks to the whole cancellation crisis, it was basically a vote of no confidence in their current style. So people who were still in charge were still in charge. And all it did was shake them up and keep them from leaving the show and putting someone fresh in because it was basically like a tarnished show. So what they came up with was they thought, hmm, well, the, our show is kind of on trial now. You know, it's... Uh, Ooh, it could be in a sticky situation, awaiting execution. So why don't we make our a season-long arc about the Doctor being on trial? Oh, please don't tell me that was actually the, the real reasoning behind it. Yeah, that's why they made it a oh trial. Oh, my it God. To, it was to mirror the fact that Doctor Who itself was on trial. Ow. It was like meta-commentary. So somehow, yet again, I managed to pick an episode which has pretty much mirroring as its entire theme. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I didn't have any mirror alerts in this, but okay, we can. We so can you just that. created your own mirror. Alert. Alert. Thanks for that, guys. <laughs> Thank you, cat. Thank you. Okay. So, Best thing you can count on your friends. Yes, but it's here's kind of the, here's the though. damn thing about it. That's exactly what you said, cat. The whole idea, the theme of the the series is the doctors on trial, and yet all you got to do is cut like ten minutes of the episode. And this could just be any other Doctor Who. <laughs> yes. Here, here's, the, here's the thing about the trial stuff, Cat. There are a few interesting bits that fit in with the overall theme of it and the ending, which ties into the next episode. But here's how the trial goes. It goes one of two ways. They basically just cut from the episode back to the trial room because the conceit of it all is that they're watching these events happen in the trial room. and It's you know, an intergalactic it's, clip show. Hmm. It's saying. an intergalactic clip show. The previous two episodes were the prosecution, the Valiar trying to prove that the Doctor is a no-good meddler in time and space and should be stopped, and basically showing, here's one of your previous adventures, and look how goddamn irresponsible you are. Well, I mean... And that shouldn't be too hard, to be fair. Oh, no. no we're, I mean, talking about Colin, we're talking about Colin Baker's doctor here, too. But, we will get to this yeah. later on, but um, anyway. for, for defending himself, he doesn't do the greatest of jobs. No. Yeah. But no. the, the point here is the terror of the Vovard section of the trial is the doctor's defense case. And what he's done is he's chosen an adventure from his personal future to prove that he is good and he will improve in the future. <laughs> As we will see, this is... He picked the worst possible thing and didn't consider the ramifications of this. And the worst possible but, companion. Well, yeah. That's also interesting because this is the debut of Mel, except yeah. since it's in his future, they just go along... And they're already established as a companion duo. This is not like them meeting for the first time. Meeting a companion out of <laughs> secrets with time? That damn hack Stephen Moffat doesn't pick a movie original. <laughs> oh, God damn it! And let me say... Yeah, we never actually see the first adventure with the Doctor and Mel. Uh, it's alluded to somewhere. There's like a book, maybe like in the audio somewhere about There'll it. There'll be a big Finnish audio of it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, there's some stuff. In, like that, but anyway, the point is, this does raise a couple of weird questions. The Doctor can just peek into the Matrix at his own future. And it's not like a multi-Doctor story where you have the excuse of, oh, the timelines are out of sync. Once he leaves this adventure, he'll forget it all and then it'll be fresh. There's no, like, bullshit sci-fi explanation for that, so... Does the Doctor in Terror of the Vovoids already know everything is going to happen because he saw it in the trial or wibbly wobbly? That's the easiest line. way to explain it, isn't it? That he saw the, the, the Matrix footage and that's how he knows of it. 
basically. I basically. believe in the background to this. Say um, that the other time lords erased his memory at the end of it because having too much knowledge of the future could lead to bad stuff, including certain things not happening. I, I believe in the backstory to this. Uh, he is given both he and the valley are given time to go into the matrix to prepare their respective uh, cases. Yeah, the doctor does have time. Yeah, in between the last story and this one, he has time to go and prepare his defense. So. Presumably, he must have looked like a shitload of, like, future Wait, adventures. so are you telling me that technically within canon, he could have gone to the Matrix, saw the Pyramid series with those fucking monks, and stopped that from happening? Yes. <laughs> Theoretically? Yes. Maybe. Colin Baker is the worst doctor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I want to I focus on the trial here just to p prove that Cat really didn't miss much. Because the cutaway you trial scenes... Me I didn't. I the cutaway trial scenes minus the ending bit. They they either take one or two forms. Form one is they cut away and the value art says something like, So, Doctor, another example of your irresponsible, reckless nature. And the doctor's like, I object, how dare you? I was doing the right thing. And then the uh, judge I, the I inquisitor. inquisitor inquisitor she's like be silent both of you let's continue to watch this and they I cut away and all the time lords swivel their little heads around to watch the matrix screen and we go back into the actual story i have a question yes was the inquisitor spanish oh my god no 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 she was played by linda bellingham oh yeah. well that's unexpected Cutaway oh, type two is a little more is a little more interesting, but we've seen lots and lots of uh, variations of it over the previous stories in the trial, where something will happen, and then it'll cut to the trial room, and the doctor will jump and say, "Wait a minute, that's bullshit! I didn't do that. That's not how it happened." And the Valyard will be all smug, and he'll be like, "Oh, so doctor, you deny the evidence of the Matrix, which can never lie." Petty excuses to try and save your own ass from destruction. And the Inquisitor will again go, Big, will you two shut the fuck up and yeah, watch basically. the goddamn show? So, repeated um, variations, at least once an episode, I think, in Terror of the Rovoids, especially, of, wait a minute, I didn't do that, that's bullshit, that didn't happen when I looked at the tape. The well, thing that sent me into orbit about these various trial cutaway scenes is that every time the Time Lords go back to viewing the footage, they play the same damn clip of them turning their heads. Basically. I have a, I have a second question, and this one is a, is an actual non-joke one. Um, just to make sure I have this correct, and spoiler alert for people who might want to see trial, although we're like we're in the middle of the trial, so you shouldn't be watching this episode anyways, but um, the Valyard is like a version of the doctor correct oh it's boy like yes um <laughs> can i take yeah. this one you don't have to explain it you just have go to go ahead go ahead it. yes yes i'll explain so, it later but yes he is would then theoretically he have memories of being colin baker as the doctor probably Possibly, although again, we'll get to that when we talk about his role in the in the events, the episode. But um... right, I'm sure. So, I guess what the question I'm asking is: Could it be that the Doctor did not pick his technically his own version of events, but he picked what the Valyard saw as the truth and put it into the Matrix himself? That's not really the implication when we get to the trial finale. It actually has been fucked with. Yeah, they, the they do explain it in the final two <laughs> episodes of Trial, so... I did not know that, so it's a good thing that I asked. That's that's fair enough. Because, as you said, your version yeah. didn't have the Trial bits. Yeah. And that well, just... That, that, that again... Cool? That again be? proves that the their grand idea for a big relaunch, you can just nick ten minutes of it and play it like any other Doctor Who episode. Yeah, you don't lose a yeah. huge amount. <laughs> I, I mean, arguably, other episodes kind of... I, I think you could get away with doing it to the first one. The second one, you can, but it would really fuck things. Yeah. But anyway, now that we've gotten the trial uh, nonsense out of the way, we can actually like take a look at 
the Doctor Who adventure that occurs for the majority of the runtime. It's about time. So, uh, this is a... F- I wouldn't say it's the greatest episode ever. It's not the worst either. If you just take it as a standalone episode without the trial bits in it. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a standard the... romp. It's, it's funny you say that. I had fun. I had it's fun funny you say that, Rainiac, because uh, I've brought up before, I think, when we were talking about Pip and Jane Baker for Ronnie Watch, that infamous uh, 80s interview show thing where Chris Chibnall, a little teenage Chris Chibnall was on there. We keep going back to that interview, but yes. I, I, I know, I know. I, but he was criticizing, oh, what you wrote. It was all just standard routine Doctor Who, Monsters and Corridors. This was the episode he was talking about. Ah, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was talking about her voice, so... I mean, considering that for, what, two of the... What was it, four episodes, technically? Yeah, four. It's a four-part Two of the four episodes, we didn't even have the her voice? I mean, he's not really making any sense for that. Hmm. Well, two two of the four episodes, it should have just been called Terror, because there were no her voice present at all. I wouldn't even call it terror because it was just basically mummy on the Orient Express without the mummy. Mild inconvenience of the vervoids. <laughs> Slight disappointment with vervoids. So, yeah, with all that out of the way, terror the vervoids. What do we got? Well, you, you've touched on, on Mel, this being her, her debut adventure. What? What? A goddamn debut scene, huh? Yes. Carrot juice. Oh, Jesus. And spoilers, by the way, for the for the end of the trial, that's Colin Baker's final words of the show. It's true. Carrot juice, carrot juice, carrot juice, and then he regenerates into the rest of the court. And then we, and then while well, we see what, how he uh, regenerates. Yes, big big finish did actually um, do him justice in the end. They did do a full proper regeneration for him. And there was a rather beautiful uh, video that was released a few weeks ago. Yeah, that was really well done, actually. Yeah, which was basically giving him a proper on-screen regeneration. Mm-hmm. If I can find that, I will link it, because it, it deserves to be seen. Check that description, kids. Yeah, and, and uh, for all that Colin Baker gets gets crap for being the, a bad doctor, I thought he was all right in this one. He's... He's fine. It was a fun romp. I had fun at least. Yeah. Like, I know fandom likes to treat the Colin Baker era as like opening the Ark of the Covenant or some shit. Like you throw it on and your face well, on it because it's so bad. The thing of this one, it kind of was very Ark of the Covenant. I, I thought oh, the fandom. Yeah. I thought the fandom liked to treat the Colin Baker era as uh, end of Case of Rani, scene missing, start of time of the Rani. <laughs> Oh, God. I think fandom would do that, except they'd replace Time the Ronnie with Remembrance of the Daleks. But... Well, and then, and then just have Sylvester McCoy. Who's this guy? He's the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> well, Basically. I mean, if you go straight from the seventh doctor to the new Who without knowing about the movie, it's pretty much the same thing. Basically. Yeah. But, you know, the no, movie is... Who the hell is this yeah. Paul McGann guy? That was a movie's a hell of a thing. So, I mean, we also didn't find out to the war doctor. Denial, uh, denial is not just a river in Egypt. So anyway, back to Terror of the Voice. Back to Terror of the Voice. Back to Terror of the Voice. Terror of the Voice. Yeah, um, it's a bit, it's not base under siege, it's a ship under siege. It's, it's, it, it, Kat hit the nail on the head when she compared it to Tommy on the press. It's, it's Christy in space. It kind of is, because we, we have a traitor slash murderer amongst the passengers or crew. There's mystery. There's a couple of little clues here and there for you to spot if you're particularly... There's alive. a lot of deaths. There's, There's a lot of... no terror whatsoever. <laughs> Not really, but there's a lot of deaths. Yeah. If you want to sum up this episode, you. just uh, just throw on the the, uh, the AEW theme for Lance Archer. Everybody dies, and you've pretty much got the pace of it. Oh my god! Instead of having a dartboard where whenever whoever the dart lands on dies, it's mostly just whoever the dart lands on actually gets to live in this one. 
like two named characters. <laughs> Spoilers. Uh, two named characters get to live. Basically. I mean, and that's a better track record than some Doctor Who's. Of it. Yes, true. Our, our big um, our big name guest star, then, is uh, is Anna Blackman, who sadly we just lost. She, she just passed right. away, I think, this past month, Anna Blackman. It's a coincidence. I didn't know we were doing this, but I did rewatch Goldfinger, like, a few weeks ago. Yeah. I watched that for my birthday a few months back, but, um... Yeah. A few and months. you spent God, yesterday what, evening watching Diamonds Are Forever. It was two How months was that, ago. Egg? I said two months ago. I said a few months ago. It was two months. My birthday was two months ago, not a few. Bloody pandemic, right. <laughs> Time has no meaning anymore. It's been 84 years. <laughs> it's going to be in... Oh, God, it's only going to be in a month. Jesus. Kill me now. <laughs> no, I've got I've got months to go. <laughs> but if, if we kill you, doesn't that defeat the purpose of a birthday? I mean, it's a birthday. It's in a singular birth. I've already been born once. That's the end of it. So, yeah, let's just you know, let's go ahead and just end it all. Okay, moving back to the Doctor Who episode very rapidly because it's getting very dark. Uh, this, yeah, we're going. So, uh, so Anna Blackman uh, plays yeah. um, Professor Lasky, and it's fairly obvious from the start that Professor Lasky is up to no good, as you know, scientists usually are in Doctor Who. Unfortunately, she kind of reminded me a little bit of the Ronnie in a weird way. Uh, that same yeah, sort of, I, I'm all about science attitude. Yeah, remind but... you of who? The Ronnie. Ronnie. Oh, oh, and it's Pip and Jane too. Oh God. God, the horseshoe oh. theory is strong with this one. Uh... Oh no. no but wait, uh, did Pip and Jane Baker technically invent the Ronnie for their episodes, or? Yes. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Okay, so then I think that this is just proto Ronnie right here. It's not proto. This came after. This came after Mark of Ronnie. This was. This is between Mark and Tom. Well, then this is the clone of the Ronnie. <laughs> Attack of the clones. Just don't give Big Finish any ideas. They it's got time for that. Actually, no. Give them ideas because they keep using the same ones over and over. Oh snap! But dumb Tish. Uh, <laughs> Well, there goes our future endorsement from Big Finish. Way to go, Jerry. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You're too kind. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the, the supporting cast aren't much to, to write home about. They're, they're mostly one-dimensional stereotypes. We've got a security officer who's uh, about who's to retire. One day from voyage. retirement. Yes. Literally. <laughs> we've got a technician. Uh, we've got a stewardess. We've got the scientist and her two assistants. One of the assistants is really, really jumpy. And we've got the Commodore, Travers. And Commodore's a bit interesting in too. that he actually recognises the Doctor. Hmm. Now, I don't believe this guy showed up in a previous serial, did he? He did not. No, so they've, they've had adventures off camera together. Mm-hmm. Or when I say adventures, he's not very pleased to see the Doctor, so obviously the Doctor has uh, blundered in to, to the Commodore's uh, affairs once before. As you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that, that was a, a nice touch, I thought. You know, interesting character that kind of knew of the Doctor and had some past history with him. It's a neat dynamic they have, where it's like, they, he doesn't have to waste time, like winning over the authority yeah. but at the same time it's not an instant trust it's just like oh gee now now you're here too oh god and every time it's just like why in the name of god are you sneaking around my ship setting off fire alarms oh for the love of christ doctor basically this... the commodore is every doctor who fan when uh, colin baker started acting <laughs> <laughs> jesus we give Colin Baker far too much crap on this. <laughs> oh, God. The fun part is, I actually like Colin Baker. It's just shitting on him is so much fun. It's like uh, being a dead horse at this point, though. It's, it's been done so many times. I don't like Colin Baker. Just his writing. And well, his coat. At the very least, it's a dead horse, not a dead pig. Because David Cameron would be all over that. Oh, God. You went there. I told you it would come later. I Ana- warned you. Another square on the bingo card filled in. Yeah, I mean, we got mirrors, we got pigs. 
I just too, bad Murray Gold, too bad Murray Gold isn't in this one. We could have a big prize. Oh, really? Yeah, we did you're, our re things. you're really gonna t you're really gonna turn my love of Murray Gold on me like that. Thanks. You like when you turn everything else against you. It's you know. it's times <laughs> like this you really find out who your friends are, and guess what? They're not in this call with me. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm actually offended. Oh, my gosh. I wasn't being serious. Come on now. <laughs> You're still offended, aren't you? And here I am, just over here, sitting in a, you know, a deteriorating city in a deteriorating country. All I did was love you. And you, what do I get for it? You, you promised me you weren't going to bring up the global situation. 100% true. I hate you. Go away. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> as, as resignation lets us go, that was pretty damn good. Uh, <laughs> Nothing but love in this podcast. By the way, people, we are joking. We are joking. <laughs> well, you know yeah. what? At the, at the end of the day, my world is on fire. You know, how about yours? <laughs> no. That's the way I like it. So, you know, I'll never get bored. <laughs> you just... She did. Hey, now. You're an all-star. <laughs> go play. <laughs> I will leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> anyway. It's up to you to decide whether that would be applauding or smacking my head to the desk repeatedly. So, a lot of part one is just basically mystery and intrigue and with, mixed with a couple of the aforementioned two types of trial scenes I mentioned. And uh, yeah. then we get to the end of part one, which is actually a pretty good cliffhanger, all things considered. This scared the hell well, it didn't scare the hell out of me, but it took me completely by surprise. Mm hmm. So it's a setup. Uh, Mel is investigating in the hold of the ship, where she's not supposed to be, but one of the like uh, technicians, uh, employees on the ship, whatever, is going to let her uh, have a look, just for fun, just to peek. And they go to uh, the place where the professor Lasky is keeping her the experiments. Hydroponic the hydroponic center. Yeah. Yeah. And he goes to open up the uh, gate, and shit explodes. He's electrocuted. He's electrocuted. Mel is screaming, and you know that Bonnie Langford can scream like a champ. Everything's blowing up. She does indeed scream in the pitch of the cliffhanger sting. Ah! I will say there was a there was a comment I saw that said, "Wow, she managed to scream in a perfect F." <laughs> And F I don't know anything about pitch, but... Yes, I went there. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> What's interesting is uh, I, I remember this because I've seen it on the uh, like special features of the DVD and whatnot. Is the line that the technician says as he's getting electrocuted? He says, "I'll go first. We don't want you breaking your neck. At least not until." And then they get Bang. fried. But what was he gonna fucking say? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, we shall never know. We shall never know because it gets fried and it's a pretty effective goddamn cliffhanger. At least, you, at least, at least, not until you've answered for the death of your sister and paid for your crimes. <laughs> we know, but in a story with so much like intrigue and ooh, everyone on board could be a suspect. Anyone could be the killer. <laughs> Apart from the guy who's just electrocuted, yes. Yeah. Hmm. Well. He could have been the killer. Well, the then, then again, again, the rooms about the suspect, Paul. <laughs> well, I mean, well, you also forgot one thing. I mean, um, <laughs> it was the whole thing that started off the murder plot, which is that they found that uh, the guy in room six, who did they ever give his name? Yeah, his name is Grenville. Grenville, yeah. But, his, so, but, his real, but that's actually a cover identity. Yeah, his real name is Howard. Later. Yeah. So, in part. And when he first enters the ship, two. when he first enters the ship, an old man who I think is called Kimber. Yes. I'm trying hard not to make a reference to the fugitive, but the old man Kimber, he recognizes Hallett. 
And he says, don't I know you? And he says, you must be mistaken. So he's obviously trying to not draw attention to himself. And then yeah. uh, Grenfell slash Hellet's uh, boot is found in a trash pulverizer. Which vents rubbish out into space to be literally vaporized. Which I seriously have a problem with this later on, but we'll wait until later on to get into it. But pretty much, yeah, this starts off the whole murder mystery thing. Because a guy just got put into a pulverizer and nobody knows who he was or where he went or why. So blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, the Doctor has received a distress signal from somebody on board the ship. They don't know who it is. And he and Mel go to investigate. Why? Remember, because um, he also sent a message to Mel through the exercise room headphones. Don't don't ask. Just don't ask. Yes, the um, the, uh, the person also tries to contact Mel via the exercise room headphones, and I think that's where they they mentioned room six. Oh, and I think that also gets her down into the hypotonics. Oh, I just thought about something. Oh, we'll go on. Wait. We'll have to wait until later okay. on. With yeah. The review. Okay. So, and it is, it's uh, yeah. this that brings the Doctor and Mel into conflict with uh, with the Commodore for the first time. Mm-hmm. And the security officer, I think his name is Rudge. Rudge, yes. I'm, I'm struggling to think of their actual names because, as I said, they're not particularly <laughs> well drawn. I can kind of remember since I've seen this one a couple times, but, I, but yeah. It's not, like, super important. Anyway, that takes us into part two and... Uh... We actually get, like, monster vision now in the story with spooky plant monsters. Yes, poison ivy vision is in effect. Which which is just, hey, use your 80s, like, CSO to put some green filter around the screen and move in uh, and move in first person on a guy and have the guy go, ah! I swear every show did this. Every show that had, like, a monster or an alien did this in the 80s and 90s. Power Rangers did it. <laughs> Doctor Who did it. They all did it. I mean, Power Rangers, it's literally just it. when they have like Lord Zed looking down on on, uh, on Angel Grove, they just like superimpose his like <laughs> shape of his eyes on a black screen. Can we, oh, I got this in my notes. The uh, amazing Colin Baker moment where he says that he's blessed with tact and finesse. <laughs> And everyone who's seen Todd Baker in any of these doctors is like, you what, mate? Tact and finesse. It's, Wearing it's that even... jacket. Wearing that coat. <coughs> tact and finesse. It's, it's, it's even funnier when once you see what he does immediately after because he found some uh, weird seeds in uh, Cabin 6 when they were investigating. So he decides, well, hmm. Seeds, yeah, so he, so he decides, uh, hmm, I should ask the professor about this. And he does. And she immediately calls over the stewardess because she thinks he stole the seeds. She thinks he's a thief, so, yes. <laughs> so his tact and finesse almost got him fucking arrested. He tactfully gets himself taken in by security. <laughs> <clears throat> Which, uh, oh, this leads into uh, the amazing scene. Uh, so we haven't commented on these characters yet, but the uh, spaceship... Is a <clears throat> it's making a run between the planet Mogar and planet Earth, so there are two Mogarians on board who they don't breathe oxygen, so they wear these like diving suit spacesuit things, like discount Darth Vader. Let's put it that way. Discount Darth Vader. I like these guys. Anyway, I like the concept of these guys. Anyway, to relax on the lounge of this ship in the 30th century, mind you. Since this story takes place exactly 1,000 years in the future, 2,986, to relax and unwind on the cruise ship, these aliens from another planet sit down and play Galaga. I'm not shitting you. Magarians playing Galaga over there. They thought we wouldn't notice, but we did. <laughs> uh, it, that, that's exactly what I said. I said one of us is going to make an Avengers reference. Watching this. Yeah. I didn't know what the hell you were talking about on Discord. You said that. Oh, <laughs> right. Gallagher. Yeah, gotcha. Gallagher. I, understood, I understood that reference. It's straight, it's straight, it, might, it might be Galaxian. I honestly can't tell. Well, either way, I, just, I understood that reference. Yeah. Yes. Oh, wait, I heard you the first time. Good job. <laughs> but... Yeah. Look, it's not it's that, not me unless I, I signpost it twice, okay? 
But that's just really cute that they're just playing Galaga. It it's wouldn't just... be me if I didn't take a joke and run it into the ground. Uh... But this leads into an interesting scene, and it's part of the, a clue of the mystery. And indeed, one of the trial scenes actually does like have Colin Baker highlight this for the benefit of the court. I wonder how the hell Cat actually, saw this so particular scene, because yeah. if it's up the trial stuff three, out... Yeah, there are actually three Mulgarians on board now. Yeah, and I... uh, they have a scene where they're talking to the guy, to the stewardess or somebody. I don't know who they're talking to. And one of the key things you need to know that Mulgarian, they don't like natively speak English. They have translators, which technically they wouldn't need since the TARDIS is there and telepathic service. Yeah, I guess I guess Pip and Jane Baker weren't really thinking about that. But anyway. The clue that you see is that two of the Mulgarians turn on their trans their translators to talk, but the third one doesn't. And the reason the third one doesn't is Hang because on, before, before you say that, um, so like I said before, I did not have the trial scenes in this. So you're mm -hmm. saying that as like pretty much as soon as they pointed, as they did that scene, they had a trial scene where the doctor was like, "Look, look, that guy didn't." turn on his translator, right? Well, no, no, some, no. It's not, um, it's not until after the next scene that happens After here. the next scene, okay. He but he does, the footage. I think he does point out that there was, there's an important clue there. Yeah, he, by the way, it, by the way, they still point out the clue, right? They point out that a clue exists, and then the next scene happens, and then the doctor comes back and points out, ah, but you missed the clue. Let's yeah. wind back the footage and look. He basically says someone's about to die, and if you if you paid attention, you know exactly who it's going to be. Okay. And everyone's well, like, what the hell's that, going on here? Then? Uh, but, so what happens is... Jane do not know how to write a murder mystery because I did not notice that at all. And again, mm. all my trial scenes were cut. Yeah, yeah all I, your trial scenes were cut. I had so you noticed wouldn't. I had noticed yeah. that he had walked in and he did not press his translator, but what I automatically thought was, oh, he pressed it before he walked in just to be preemptive. Yeah. No, that was no, that was actually a clue. That, that was, was a really clue. shitty clue. A clue that they, they immediately signpost, but, you know. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, the point is that Mogarian takes a drink of a Mogarian-friendly drink because... As we find out later, uh, their their oxygen kills them, so they don't drink uh, actual water. I guess I don't know what whatever it is, water, or or maybe it was just poisoned. I'm not sure. Whatever it is, this Mogarian drinks and he starts choking and he falls over dead. And it's actually Grenville Hallett. Yeah, in a Mogarian outfit. <laughs> as, as the doctor says, tries to take the mask off, he says, "If you take that off, you'll kill him because he's." he's Oxygen toxic to Megarians. It's like a, he's not a Megarian. Takes the mask off, and there is Hallett slash Granville. Mm -hmm. And now I can finally make that point. So, the idea is that Mel was given that message by the same guy, correct? Yes. And that was to get the doctor and her over to the cabin, correct? Yes. Why would they go to an empty cabin when, by this point, he had already been in disguise? Fair point. He left them there on purpose. So that they could find the cabin that was all messed up, find his shoe, and then correlate that shoe with the one that was in the trash pile, giving him an alibi so nobody would be looking for him. Ooh, yeah. Clever. He did that on purpose because he knew that the old guy had recognized who he was. Pretty much and announced the entire ship that he was an investigator. Yes. And now he's technically out of the way. Mm -hmm. and, and the... Um... That is smart writing. The, the old guy didn't do it. That is smart writing. Um, I know it's sort of like that, but yes. <laughs> the old guy doesn't do it out of, out of malice. He just recognizes him. No, but he still <laughs> technically blew the guy's cover. Yeah, in, in, in the process, he, he the jeopardizes guy, everything. Yeah. And, and um, it's it's Speaking pretty obvious guy. by this point that um, even though you, you thought that Grenville was being a, a shady character, he actually was a good guy. Speaking of the old guy, he bites it right about now. He bites point. it at the end of part two, yes. Yeah. And we still haven't and the seen what's killing two, Actually, uh, speaking of the world on fire, the end of part two has, some, has a Lasky and Co. being the only ones actually sensible because they keep going in and out of this mysterious isolation room and they're the only goddamn ones on this ship wearing face. Yeah, so Lasky, Bruckner, and Doland are their names. Yes. Lasky's the professor, Doland and Bruckner are her two assistants. 
Uh, so going back to Colin, uh, Colin Baker's tact and finesse, uh, Colin Baker <laughs> tactfully takes an axe and finesses it right into a fire alarm. <laughs> So they could sneak into the isolation. Yeah, this room. this this uh, removes the guard from the from the scene because he he goes to run off to to help the passengers that are not actually not uh, in any kind of trouble. And he gets into the room, and our cliffhanger part two is they open this pod, and this horrifying monstrosity stares back out at them. It's actually a really good like practical makeup effect. The yeah. way this like this like half plant lady, and she's got like roots on her face and pulsating it's really good effective and good it's a really great effect that they never use again because eventually she just outright fucking dies yeah yeah they have her for this reveal and then like in part three or four somewhere the fucking vervoids just part come four, in the and kill just had to destroy I everyone they come across there's no explanation as to how she got combined with the plant matter yes there There's is no yes there is there is. Well, did it yeah. happen in a trial scene? No. no. She was okay. infected. They were doing experiments. She had a cut on her finger, and okay. the ex their experimental pollen or whatever got into her blood and turned her into a hat. Yeah, she she is um, Dolan's assistant, lab assistant, and she was infected with pollen from a sample of the vervoids. And turned into a scary plant. Yeah, so they, they were keeping her in the isolation room to keep her safe and hidden from the other from the other people in the jet. Either that part was cut out or I missed it because I honestly didn't. It's it's fair happened. enough. We it's did a fine, recap. It's, it's fine. Either That's a way, nice she's, she's just uh, she's just there to have a second yeah. history for something. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, things are ramping up. Have hatched at the end of part one, and they're they're just roaming around. Killing people. We've gotten like little glimpses and teases of them. I think we've yeah. seen one of their faces. It's not until part three when we actually see a full vervoid. And uh, yeah, I think we need to talk about the vervoids. We design. do. Yeah, because they look, like some, um, they look like some mean green mothers from outer space. That's for sure. Oh, you went there. Yeah. Yes. Exact. Wait. Wait. Not. Not quite that part. Well. Uh, I know what they look like, and I have an image here that perfectly shows exactly what they look like. Oh, no. Yeah. Can, 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 wait, can, we can't put that on screen, can we? Oh, yeah, we can. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, the Queen of Emma's paint strikes again. Oh, also, oh. they kind of look like big vaginas. Oh, goddamn millennial voids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't even see that now. They're going around killing the, the previous generation. Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus well, Christ. <laughs> well, they look like this, and at the end, they turn nice and crispy and brown like toast. So. <laughs> oh, my fucking God. <laughs> But yeah, they, they also look like really big fucking vaginas. Let's just yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think actually they, they, uh, the people, someone in charge of like Doctor Who magazine or whatever, got flack when they put the vervoids on the cover. Like someone was like, "You cannot put something that obscene on the cover of a children's Doctor Who magazine. How dare you?" Oh, uh, don't get your pants in the bunch, mate. It's it's not that obscene. <laughs> Well, that, that, that's, you know, BBC execs in the 80s, you know. I never! How dare! Will somebody well, please think of the it children? It really is super obscene, because not only does the entire thing look like a vagina, but if you look at the top of its head, it looks like the head of a certain male body part. Oh, dear God. Yep. So it's two for one. H.R. Giger, eat your heart out. So yeah, the the, the verbal design not not so great. <laughs> and Cat was surprised going into this that they talk. They talk. Well. They don't just talk. They vape. They vape. <laughs> That's right. Oh god, they really are millennials. They really are millennials. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Oh my god. Why am I saying that? I'm a millennial. I'm a millennial too. Why are we saying? <laughs> I think we all are. Because we don't know any better. <laughs> well, if you're I mean, a millennial, you're right. I've got to be. Because I'm younger than you. So. 
<laughs> I mean, had the Vervoid succeeded, then Millennials would have killed Doctor Who, so. <laughs> well, <laughs> and in time as Charles succeeds, they have killed Doctor Who. Hi, oh, no, well, no, Ch Chibnall's not a Millennial. <laughs> no, 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 the Backlash 2 is. <laughs> oh, God almighty. Actually, who am I kidding? They're not, they're not flipping Millennials. They're like Ian Levine. Yeah, they're boomers. Actually, did Ian Levine no, wait, dislike no, no, Thomas no, no, no. I don't think he did. I, do you think I look up what Ian fucking That's Levine a very good point. Day? That's a very, very good point. No. No, I don't. Anybody cares about Ian Levine? I could not give less of a shit. He he did seem to enjoy the uh, the Fugitive of the Doom, so uh, maybe there's, there's, there's hope. Mm. Maybe there's yeah. hope. Maybe. Maybe. Anyway, back to good stuff. Uh, well. Back to good stuff, he says. Going back to the Colin Baker I'm going to say, back to slightly less bad speaking stuff. Of, hey, hey, actually, speaking of Ian Levine, you know what the last straw for him was? Casting Bonnie Langford. Really? Yeah. I mean, the last straw for my eardrums was, was casting Bonnie Langford. Uh, <laughs> She doesn't scream that much in this one. Thankfully, she does not, no. Hmm. I mean, we yeah, joke that her, her screaming got her the part, but let's be yeah. honest, her screaming got her the part. I don't actually have that much on the notes for this for part three. It's more escalation and uh, bad Well, something, shit something rather worse. major does happen in, at the end of part three. The end of part three, yeah. I'm yeah. talking about like, and, the um, We have a brief subplot with Mel almost getting pulverized in the pulverizer, which... Uh, I think leads into Kat's uh, critique of the pulverizer itself. Yeah, yeah a, a little bit. Um, so they have this, for some reason, part of the main set is a fucking exercise room. So they like have a whole bunch of shit happen in this <coughs> exercise room. Um, so, you know, Mel gets the message, important plot stuff between, you know, the, all the, the um, professor's people. assistants coming in and telling her plot relevant stuff. Uh, and this one where Mel hears something going on in the vents, I believe. So she grabs one of the headsets, and in a really, really smart move, she takes the microphone of the headset and puts it into the vent, goes into the control room that's nearby, and turns up the volume, um, as well as, I think, accidentally turns on a recorder because she has no idea what she's doing. It's an alien technology. Um, and she starts recording and listening to the vervoids that are in the vents talking about how they're going to kill all the, uh, the animals on board, they hate humanity, blah, 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 blah. Mel gets gassed by an unknown person. She screams. And the person picks her up, takes her over to... If you've ever been to a hotel or something and you see one of those big bins that they like throw all the towels and stuff into, and he just puts her in there very carefully, like, just sort of drapes a towel over her face. Nothing else of her, just her face. Puts the lid on. And then a technician comes in and picks up the bin, which, you know, that's that's pretty normal. He's just doing laundry or whatever. And then for some reason, he takes the bin over to the pulverizer and starts emptying it all into the pulverizer. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you pulverizing perfectly good towels? You take that shit and you wash it and clean it. Surely, in space, they have a way to clean stuff without using water. Which I'm sure is probably the reason why they thought about this. But also, it's, it's towels. Why are you throwing away towels? In space, no one can hear you clean. <laughs> you! <laughs> you fuck this, this direction, like... I, I'm not even a hardcore person who's all into, you know, like, save the trees and stuff. I still eat meat, but I still want, you know, animals to be treated correctly. I want to conserve water and all that. So I understand. I really do. But also, I mean, come on. This is such an arbitrary way to get Mel into danger just so she could be saved. It is. It is Basically. so stupid. I, I can't deny that at all. Yeah, that's that's what they did, you know. <laughs> also, I mean, she's a human woman. Let's let's be generous and say, let's just do a even one hundred pounds. 
I'm sure that's not actually what she weighs, but let's say it's an even 100 pounds. Does this person actually think that with the couple of, like, handful of people that we've actually seen on board, that they're going to use that many towels to make the bin that fucking heavy? <laughs> Welcome to the Unnamed Extra in, in, in a science fiction program. You're probably not going to have the most of intelligence. But still, even people who, you know, f- you know, do garbage bins and stuff, they will still check the the bins to make sure that there's nothing weird in there. The whole thing is contrived. I agree with you. He, you wouldn't think that he would look in there and be like, "Oh, it's this is like absurdly heavy. Maybe somebody accidentally <clears> put <throat> in a weight or something." Or they have those headsets. What if someone, you know, took off the headset and put it in a towel to clean it, and then just threw the whole towel in? Or he opens the bin and goes, oh, God, it's Boyd Langford, and throws them to the trash compactor immediately. Oh or that. <laughs> Jesus. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> Seriously, you two. Pip and whatever the other person's name is. Pip and Jane. Pip and Jane. Pip and Jane. Why are you so environmental? I mean, they were. Why are you getting everything? They, they, they were. I mean, they, yeah, they were pretty environmental. The, the entire reason they wrote Vervoids is uh, they read, like, articles or something about how plants can feel pain or something to that effect. Oh, God, that makes the, fin- the, the finale even worse. Yeah. Maybe keep it to themselves, and they should just go be super ultra-vegan and eat rocks. Anyway, the, 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 main, the main hook for, for the end of part three is this. Bruckner has been slowly losing his mind throughout the serial. And he snaps. Okay, actually, can we can can, can can I highlight one or two little things? You can. Yeah. Okay, so the first is another one one of the uh, bad edits of the trial of the of the Vervoid episode. You know, something to make the doctor look bad. Anyway, the communications room gets trashed and broken, so nobody on the ship can contact help back at Earth or whatever. Yeah. And that that actually happens. In, in the events that what doesn't happen is the scene where Colin Baker standing in the room in the ruined room with all the broken equipment holding an axe and looking immensely self-satisfied yes so for and me, it immediately cuts to what what the fuck I didn't do that it's fine it's fine He's oh, just yeah. boring it. you did so for me what I had was it ends the scene and then it goes straight to the Commodore um, hmm. going into the communication room and seeing it all messed up. Automatically, yeah. I of course thought, "Oh, it was the uh, the killer and the whole thing." Which, it wasn't until yeah. you mentioned to me that, "Hey, it was actually Colin Baker," and uh, we are, you know, trying to. Yeah, except it wasn't. But yes, it wasn't. But they made it well, look the, like it was if to you make him finish. I was going to say in a weird trying to implicate him way. Exactly. Yes. The other funny thing is, uh, there's a scene where Vervoid is trashing one of the cabins that Mel is hiding in, and it, and it made me think of like Tommy was so in the room. <laughs> He's just smashing it up. I I even wrote down in my notes, "You trashed that room, Johnny Vervoid." <laughs> <laughs> I did not eat that. I didn't eat her at all. Hi, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I hate every like animal Danny kind. I fed up in this world. <laughs> I, anyway, that's that's all I had to say about that. So uh, right, so the, next <laughs> you've broken her. You've done it. I did it. Achievement it. unlocked. Carry broken. All it, to, all it took was some Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> One of the fur boys goes up to the doctor and says, "So, how is your sex life?" <laughs> it's it's funny because the way the fur boys look. Yes. Oh, I'll try and see this away from. I'll try and see this back for the trade oh, it's, it's become. So the end of series. The end of series. The end of part three. <laughs> Hang on, Radiac. We gotta let her get the giggle. The end. The end of series three. The master dies. To refuse to regenerate. <laughs> right. Yeah. Do it. You okay now? Yes. Right. I, I got it all out. The end of. Episode three, the end of part three. Well, technically it's part twelve. But so yeah, yeah all right, part, part eleven, 11. Part, part eleven. But talking. Bruckner, Bruckner has been slowly losing his mind throughout the serial, and he snaps here. So he sort of he rails against his two uh, 
uh, his two colleagues and goes, uh, what we're doing is criminal. What we're doing is against the laws of nature. And then he, he basically finds a way to get into the control room and take it over. Yes. And he steers the ship towards a black hole. The Doctor very calmly <laughs> explains the fact he steered the ship towards a black hole, which is hilarious. It's What's weird is, I don't know if you notice the way that the ship is shaking as it does it, but occasionally, like, okay, it's in 4-3 aspect ratio. So just imagine 4-3 aspect ratio in your head. Occasionally, Ooh. the left edge of, of it will shift forward when it shakes. Like, the whole picture and all will just shift forward. It's really jarring and off-putting when you look at it. Yeah. But yeah, that's a that's Cliffhanger 3, and Mel's trapped in a room where her voice starts to uh, vape for no reason. <laughs> he just really wanted to vape. And, yeah, he just vape. I just want to vape. I fed up with this world. No, please don't. I don't think I can survive another one. <laughs> weakness, weakness found. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, though, oh, we no. should be mentioning the vaping because that's basically how we uh, resolve the cliffhanger. Well, we resolve part of the cliffhanger of Bruckner having taken over the ship. Basically, the Vervoids hotbox him in the control room. Oh my god, yeah. They, they pipe their gas. <laughs> that sounds terrible. They pipe the... <laughs> oh my god, they pipe their gas. Uh, they they managed to get the, their um, their toxic gas into the into the control room, and as you rightly say, they hotbox him to death. Not a good way to go. 420, blaze it! <laughs> <laughs> Mondo cool. <laughs> That's right, boys. Mondo, Mondo cool. cool. <laughs> but you... Anyway, surprised by the fact that none of us have ever smoked weed in our lives. Clearly. No. I mean, I, I mean, it's legal here. I... It is not legal here, and I haven't. Is it legal in Virginia? Can't. I have no idea. I th I think it's legal in Washington, D.C., but I'm not entirely sure. Okay. I mean, they don't tell you to vape to burn things there, but... Uh, anyway. <laughs> at the um, moment. Bruckner gets yeah. hotboxed, but the ship is still going into a black hole, and uh, since the place is full of vervoid vape, nobody can get in, so... Yeah, it's poisonous. We, we So lucky we've got some uh, dudes who don't need to breathe oxygen. Who can just waltz in there and uh, fix things and not pile us into a black hole? So they do. Yeah. The Megarians. So the Megarians help us out, and once they helped us out, they hijack the ship. What? It's a Russo swerve. <laughs> Along I also, with the. I would also like to say, um, slight science bullshit there. Um, black holes are huge on gravitational fields, and if the black hole has a hold of the ship enough to start making. You know, making the ship shake and have turbulence. Yeah, it's too late. They're already fucked. Mm -hmm. Also, I would like to say, well, enough in time. Twenty seventeen. Oh my god! <laughs> Can that damn mother come with anything original? I'm joking. I'm joking. But <laughs> but yeah, uh, the Megarians, along with Dun 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 Rudge, the security officer. Yeah. Hijack the ship. Only has one day left to retirement, and that retirement is him. Stealing some sort of precious mineral from a vault that's on the ship. That retirement was a heel turn. Yeah. Who could have ever guessed? Curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. Yes. So he he's teamed up with the Megarians at some point off camera that we, we they've they've come up with this. Uh, there is there is a scene where the Megarians yeah. decide we want to know. Yeah, this is what's going on, but that doesn't really that doesn't equate to oh, we're going to team up and take over the ship. Well, presumably he off does, screen, maybe they. Yeah, yeah, he sat down and talked with them. More than likely, he told them, "Hey, this is what's going on. If you guys help me, then we can take over the ship and get everything back to school. Yeah. And also, so, my only payment is I want to get this stuff. Yeah. So uh, as as far as I see, the Megarians are pissed that he, the humans are taking. Too many minerals from their planet, 
which <laughs> humanity taking too many natural and hoarding shit? Who could have guessed? Laughs in Orphan 55. <laughs> Oh god, like but he just ripped it off. It's just here's a bunch of humans. Here's how they're polluting space. Here's how they're taking all the natural resources. Here's why humans are bad. Wait, no no no. There's nothing funny about Orphan 55. Size in Orphan 55. There we go. Uh yeah, anyway. That's better. So the Megarians want the their uh, minerals back from the hold because they think, you know, it's ours. Humanity shouldn't have taken it, so we're gonna take it. And Rod just wants his uh, retirement fair. bonus, let's say. He just wants his fair share. So they so they got a deal going. It, it should it's be pointed good. out he's a very bad security officer because people keep dying on his watch. And he yeah. could not care yeah. less. Well, apparently, apparently, according to what I'm reading here, his retirement was, in fact, this was his last vi uh, voyage before he was written off. So yes. More than likely, he had just gotten too old, so they're just like, "All right, you're too old, you're useless." Bye. He pretty much so lives you know, to that in part one. So you know the yeah. typical American way of uh, employment. <laughs> oh God. But uh, the Megarians uh, get melted. <laughs> yes, they do. Like they get. I don't. It's. It it's the be worst water? scene I've ever seen. It's that either awful. it's either plain water or some sort of. Liquid that is toxic to them. It doesn't even say. It just says here <clears throat> they a liquid gets thrown at them. I think it makes sense for it to be water. Yeah, I think it makes sense for it to be water because water contains oxygen. No, 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 no. Because it says here that a liquid is thrown at them, which damages their suits and causes <laughs> them to die from exposure to the oxygen environment. So more than likely, so, it's some sort of acid. Yeah, I prefer yeah, my, the my explanation, but yeah. Say, uh, the subtitles on this part actually do say when they get splashed. It's like brackets, acid sizzling. Okay. But also, their acting in this scene is deplorable. Because it's like a scene from a cartoon where they hear something, they turn towards it, uh, there's a pause, and then stuff gets thrown at them without them ever moving. God almighty. Yeah, it's, it's not done very well. <laughs> anyway, oh, um, anyway, I'm melting, I'm melting. Oh. Yes. So well, Rich's uh, Rich's take over the ship has gone belly up because somebody's killed the Megarians, and, and he basically uh, runs away. Run away! Yeah, run he away, he runs run away, away, but he doesn't get very far because at this point the Vervoids, who now decide that they're going to kill all of animal kind, first on the mm -hmm. ship and then wherever they they end up after the ship lands, mm -hmm. are here to sorry Daleks exterminate everybody on board. Mm. So Rudge gets his pretty quickly. His retirement flag was a death flag after all. Yes, it was. There, there's some parts of this that were also missing. So when he took over the ship with the Mulgarians, uh, they also took um, the doctor, the scientist, uh, the main scientist, Professor Lady. I think it's um, everyone but Dolan, Mel, and uh, there's Dolan, one other Mel person. And, Dolan, Mel, the and the stewardess. stewardess get away. Yeah. Pretty much everybody gets taken into one of the very few scenes that they have, which is the lounge, and they're all tucked in there as hostages. Yeah. So this is another clue for your murder. It, now we've narrowed it down to only three people who could have killed the McGarry. Well, technically it's only two people because Mel is not included in this. Yeah, <laughs> except that Professor Lasky is also a suspect, and something we forgot to mention is that there's a tape. There's an incriminating tape. Yes. Yeah. The That's tape the tape that Mel, that Mel had. The yes. one that she recorded when they came back. The tape was mysteriously gone. It went missing, yeah. And the so doctor this uses this to the, figure out who his, yeah. who his man or woman is, ultimately. Mm -hmm. So Roger's is dead. He joins the, the other, the, the growing pile of corpses in this sort of storage cupboard that the, the, the Vervoids have been hanging out in. It's like the ventilation. Yeah. Duh. There's a rather hardcore bit where uh, one Vervo gets thrown into the pulverizer. Ooh. And then sadly that guy doesn't doesn't get to what live to enjoy his triumph. But um, oh. so murders are happening all over the ship. Uh, Vervoids are killing everybody. They are trying to break into the main uh, room where everyone else is. <laughs> but the doctor, the doctor is tr is trying to get to the bottom of the mystery, along with Mel now. Hey, can and can I just say the funniest part of this all is that in the lounge scene as the um. As the the Vervoids are trying, trying to bust in. in. 
all the people who are trapped inside the lounge have taken all of these wicker chairs and stacked them up against the door, and they're surprised <laughs> that the vervoids are able to get in. Well, I mean, it's offensive against some tyrants, so why not against vervoids? It is so funny. Oh, God. I know that was a pool lounger, but the point stands. <clears throat> That, by the way, was one of the, the funniest scenes ever in Doctor Who, that. <laughs> the, oh, God. The, the damn sons are and just tripping over a deck chair. Beautiful. <laughs> well, I, either way, at one point when the Doctor and everybody are in the lounge after um, Rudge has run off, the Doctor says out loud that uh, he wants permission from the Commodore to go look in everybody's cabins for this tape. And he says that this specific tape is, you know, important to the whole thing um so he runs off and this was done on purpose because when he goes to check out the rooms which mel checks out the professor's room he checks out um dolan's room mm -hmm. dolan comes in and confronts him about this yes and you know they talk and so on and so forth and i believe if i remember correctly basically dolan is like you really think the professor did this so they run off to go and find where the professor may have put the tape. No, uh, that's not quite right. So Mel has actually gone to the gymnasium because she thinks that the professor might have put it in her locker. The gymnasium? I thought she was in the room. Well, at some point the gymnasium locker is mentioned, isn't it? No, that's, no, you're right. That's where Mel goes to look for yeah, the tape. Yeah, so Mel goes to look for the tape. It's, spoilers is not there because you're, you're a separateur slash murderer. You that with Mel. It's one of the three set pieces in the entire thing. Yeah, line. it's all right. <coughs> um, your separateur slash murderer is indeed Dolan. Brainiac called it, actually. I, I did, asked, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I did ask uh, when we got to part four who y'all thought the killer was, and uh, Kat bet on the professor, and Brainiac bet on Dolan. I thought no, on a black was too I, obvious. I actually... I actually did not bet on anybody. I just jokingly said, well, maybe it's the Commodore. I mean, he looks like he's 64. Oh, yeah, you bet on, yeah, you <laughs> bet on the Commodore, but joking. Man. Yeah. I was just making a Commodore 64. Yes, we, we heard. So. <laughs> but anyway, that's well, correct. I'm marrying you, Rainiac. You repeat everything. <laughs> yeah. And the sad thing is when you repeat it, it's funny, and when I do it, anyway, moving on. Yay. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because... I, I kept this in my notes because I fucked up and, well, I didn't remember how this thing is. I wrote down that the doctor was a doofus because Dr. and Dolan go to the uh, hydroponic center and he goes to open a drawer to find, a locked drawer to find the tape. And so the doctor has this laser gun that he's been keeping on for his protection. So when he goes to open the drawer, he just sets the gun down to open the drawer so then Dolan can pull out the tape and then grab the gun and be like, ah! Yeah. So it's like, Doctor, you goddamn doofus! He did it on purpose. Exactly. This is what happens later. You, it reveals, aha, I knew you would do that, so I left the gun unloaded. And it doesn't it work like out well for Dolan part. because he runs straight into a verboard ambush. But before that, his actual like master plan to use is to use the vervoids. Basically, as a labor force. So, Dolan is a big capitalist, I guess. And then, ultimately, he meets his end in a scene that kind of looks like this here. But, you know, that happened That's... to remind me of something a little bit different. Oh, no. What are we doing? Brace yourself. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no! No! <laughs> She did it! <laughs> <laughs> that sure happened. Oh my god, cat, why? <laughs> Two first uh, podcasts have been broken over, over the knee at least once tonight. Oh, jeez, okay, that, you know, we're even, I broke her with the time it was so she got me. So, uh, the way the vervoids <laughs> actually murder people is, I guess they have, like, poison thorns. They shoot into they have, you. They have stingers. The, yeah, the, the sting, poison method of murder but is, Dolan is here, he stings. gets confronted by these four vervoids, and he's like, no, wait, I'm friend, I want to help you. Well, here, I'm your friend. And he holds out his hand to shake hands. And they shake his hand. And he's like, oh, great. And then 
they just prick his hand with the poison needle and he dies. So yeah, like... he, he pulls his hand back <laughs> to reveal a needle sticking in it. Fooled you. So what you're saying is older man gets penetrated by five plant monsters. No, no, <laughs> yes. no, we're not saying that. Oh, God. Oh, God. So uh, that leads us to our resolution, as it were. Yeah, but before that, we have to have one more needless sacrifice. Bye-bye, Lasky. Yeah, P Professor Lasky does something very stupid. She's like, oh, I can reason with them. I created them, and no, she can't. Ron Howard voice. She could not. Pretty much. I have to go now. My verb voice need be. Please don't, <laughs> Professor Lasky, die on the way to the verb voice. <laughs> anyway, the idea here okay. is... They, did, they do point out something when the doctor is talking with Lasky before... Um, you know, she eventually dies. Um, mm -hmm. He points out that the reason behind the Vervoid's hostility makes so much sense because in some form or another, all animal life consumes plant life. Yeah. So yeah. essentially, the Vervoids are just trying to survive. And uh, it's kill or be killed here, so the doctor hatches a plan. Yes, he does. And and Instead, and yeah, now instead, so what they do is they have this uh, metal in the hold called a vionesium, which is basically like magnesium, basically big bright light, phosphorus light, when you expose it to oxygen or whatever. So the idea is to expose the vervoids to it and make them grow to death or something. The idea behind it is that. Essentially, there is a life cycle for our plants. Um, it, it, you know, excluding some of them, like evergreens, which stay, you know, for evergreen throughout the year. Yeah. But the idea is that spring they usually flower, summer they, you know, have the foliage and everything. Uh, autumn they start to lose their leaves, and then winter they all die off. So the idea is that if he gives them enough sunlight, it would trick their bodies into thinking that. They're essentially going through all three of those seasons directly into winter, all simultaneously at this one point in time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one explanation that's, for it. Yeah. So, yeah, and you could see it. This will be important. You could see it as instead of him killing them, he's accelerating their life so that they live their full lives that in the span of like seconds. They live to it's death. Not how they, live, but you know. they live to death. So th this reading will become with the actual resolution with the ending trial scene. But anyway, suffice it to say, uh, they do the plan and it works. And we get a pretty neat scene of the vervoids like withering and their green leaves turning into yeah. orange autumny leaves as they uh, all basically decompose. You could say that was due to the Vionesium, or that could just be that, that Colin Baker flashed his coat at them and they couldn't take it. <laughs> God. Oh, God almighty. But yes, the, the Doctor and Mel killed them with this, this metal. And or so the adventure is over. Um, the name survivors are the Commodore and uh, the, the stewardess, who I think is Janet. Janet? Yeah, Janet. Is that a Janet, reference Janet. to Janet Fielding? No. With her being a stewardess and Janet Fielding played Tegan. Oh, God. That's, I never thought of that. That's Maybe. I don't know. It could just be a, a, a neat little in-joke. Could be a coincidence. Yeah. Seems, seems like a pretty neat coincidence. Oh, it could but, be yeah, a coincidence, like, yeah. Okay, but, uh, anyway, the fun bit happens when we get out of the adventure. Yeah. Cat didn't see this part. But, uh, Cat didn't see this, and it's kind of important to know. Basically, yeah. You, you want to do it, or shall I? Yeah, you go ahead. Okay. So the doctor shows the adventure, and he's like, well, there we go. Wrap that one up the bow. Save the human race from extinction. Destroyed all the vervoids. I'd say that's pretty good. And the valor's like, you killed every vervoid, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Did you hear that, Inquisitor? The doctor has exterminated an entire species. The charge must now be genocide. He walks into it so hard. <laughs> so the doctor, in presenting his defense, picked a story, an adventure of his life, where 
it could be argued very strongly, very strongly, that he committed genocide. Tech and finesse. Tech and finesse and a, and a death wish. Good fucking job, Doctor. Good fucking job. I find this hilarious. I'm sorry. I, I just... In train, and yet the, the the kind of the fridge genius about this is it fits the doctor perfectly, doesn't it? In trying to resolve the situation, he has to create a much worse situation. Whoops. Yeah. Sounds about right. And well, that charge leads us into the final two episodes of the trial, but er, done for now. Yeah. That was terror the verbal. That was a trip, is what that was. Uh, so, thoughts? Y'all? Yeah. Well, this was Kat's choice, so why don't we let her go first? I totally picked this just to throw a curveball, um, because both of you had honestly thought I was going to pick Twin Dilemma. Uh, so I thought, well, Underwater Menace isn't really an episode that I can do, so what's the next best thing to torment them with? Hey! Vagina monsters, why not? <laughs> so I picked Terror of the Vervoids, but honestly, um, even considering the fact that I got the one that had all the trial scenes cut out, and I didn't even know this was part of the trial at the Time Lord bit. Um, I didn't even know it was Colin Baker, so I was just like, oh shit, it's threefold, yes! <laughs> but uh, honestly, as just an episode itself without all the trial bits, this is actually pretty fun. I mean, there are some parts that obviously drove me completely, utterly insane, and I hated those parts, but that's just par for the course of a Doctor Who episode. There's always going to be parts that people don't like, that people like. Uh, sometimes that part is the entire episode, but you know. But otherwise, you know, Mel was fun. She screamed a lot less. I think she only screamed, like, what, twice in this whole thing? Mm -hmm. Maybe twice, three times? So she was fine. Uh, Colin Baker, as always, a masterpiece. A disaster. A Jackson Pollock, if anything, but a masterpiece. <laughs> no, the master was probably Anthony Ainley. Anyway, I, I had fun with it. I mean, there were some things that could be improved. It had the usual Pip and Jane Baker twist to it of environmentalism bullshit. But otherwise, I thought it was a pretty unoffensive episode that I could watch again. I'll say it. Okay. Fresno? Okay. Uh, it's fine. It's, you know, it's not the best Colin Baker episode, but it is not the worst Colin Baker episode. It's middle of the road for his era. Perhaps not as strongly tied to the trial as it could have been, save for the finale, which makes the Doctor look like a buffoon, but... Well, that's Colin Baker and his humorous for you. That's amazing character, I think. So it does kind of fit. It has some pretty funny moments. It's a somewhat compelling murder mystery with some good Doctor Who monsters, albeit very oddly designed. It's, it's fine. Not the best part of the trial, not the best part of the trial. It's fine. It, it, it's just fine to me, you know. You can have fun with it, and I'm glad Cat had How about you, Raniac? I honestly don't have too much about this to add. I mean, uh, it was perfectly okay for what it was. It's not one I would rush home to go and see again. It's not one I would slam as one of the worst episodes of all time. The, um, the design of the Megarians I really liked. Standard sci-fi alien... Um, part of the course, but I, I rather like that. I like the, the translation thing. I know you pointed out that that's a plot hole. I don't like it quite so much. Uh, the twist, the early twist that the uh, the first victim faked his own death, but then was, at, was actually killed for real. I really like that. The trial scenes kind of break up the story. Uh, the last trial scene is hilarious, unintentionally so, but hilarious. And yeah, it's not a bad debut for, um, for Mel, for Bonnie Langford. I've seen worse Colin Baker's. Nobody turns to a tree, so zero out of ten. But apart from that, yeah, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh god. It was it was just it was just fine. It wasn't good, it wasn't bad. Hmm. It was average. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you know, Doctor, Doctor Who's just Doctor be like Doctor Who podcast review if I don't traumatize you somehow, and I think I've done that with my last edited picture. <laughs> you certainly traumatized Jerry. I don't... It's true. But then again I got you with Tommy with We Yeah. We even and, and, and to be fair, I did run this by Rainiac beforehand because it is his channel. And you I'm did, yeah. I'm very respectful of the fact that it is his channel. I'm not going to put something in and demand that he I don't know it. if you would have broken me if I'd seen that for the first time when you when you linked it in the Discord. But, oh, uh, my God. I might have done. He, he did not know what the meme was, Frez. <laughs> he didn't know. He had no idea about the meme. I had to explain to yes, him. Yes, because I, I still have some innocence. I still have some innocence out there. Uh, oh, you poor sweet summer child. I will not apologize for this. We'll, 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 we'll deal with that. Don't... No, I can I can pretty much guess what the meme is about, but I will not apologize, <laughs> I will not apologize for retaining my innocence. Somewhat. <laughs> Honey, we'll get rid of that for you. Don't worry about it. Exactly. You, I was going to say, I should keep quiet because you you broke Cat, and Cat broke you. Nobody broke me tonight, which means you're going to do your level best next time we come back to do that. And next time, come hell or high water, I will find a version of the story I wanted to do, and we're going to do it. We will. Yeah. We're going to escape from the Pip and Jane Baker. Help me, God. But not from the memes. Not from the left. Never escape from the memes. Ever. Escaping Never. from memes is impossible. Of course not. So we don't know when that's going to be exactly, and we still have to do our Series 12 retrospective. You can see the dread in my voice as I said that <laughs> at some point. Putting it off? No, we're not doing that. I think we should probably do that in a few months' time, though. Mm. I mean, it's entirely up to you. You know, I think we should wait a few months, maybe about 12 or so, when the next series starts, and then we don't have to do it at all. Well, it's not going to start, though, is it, because of the pandemic? <laughs> next series starts. It's not going to start at all because of the pandemic. I know, I know. Oh, God, <laughs> we're going to be die. like literal years before we get more Doctor Who. We may not even get the Christmas special. Oh, I never even thought of that. Oh, thank well. God, we don't have to watch any more of Chibnall's writing. Just, just a couple of things to uh, take care of before we, we leave then. The final, yes I did say final, uh, Doctor Who Watch Along uh, organised by the brilliant Emily Cook is happening on Saturday. And we're going out on the high of, of, of all highs because it's the World of, world of Time and the Doctor Falls Double Bell. Mm -hmm. Good episodes. I believe that's either 6 or 7pm British time on Saturday. <laughs> There are also still classic uh, watch-alongs happening, and um, Ooh, the last watch-along prior to recording this was, was a double bill of um, of New Earth and Gridlock, and then they did a, uh, a thing about Novice Ham, and it made me cry. So that was good. Aww, that was really sweet. It was really, really well done. And it was actually David Tennant's voice. Yeah. I thought it was Jacob Dubman doing a takeoff on him. What was the last classic uh, not, watch? Not Jacob, did. sorry, not, not Jacob Dubman. Uh, the, the other guy that, that, that does... Tenant's voice. I I don't know who did the ten. Yeah, well, it wasn't it Whoever wasn't him. You are, you're talented. Flash flash his name on the screen. It was the actual it was the actual David Tennant, not the the very good person they usually get to do. No, I mean the one who the guy who you flash his name on. The I think it's Christopher somebody, but I'll, I'll look it up later. Um, the last one that we did, or the last one that was organized by um. Last one that was organized, yeah. The three doctors. Oh, three doctors. Okay, I thought I missed. No, something. no, it was the TV movie. It was the TV oh, movie oh, last weekend. Oh god! <laughs> and I don't know. I, I don't know off the top of my head which one is next. Oh god! They must really be getting dead. I, be I believe they're continuing. Um, well, the modern ones are, are uh, coming to a close mm -hmm. because this actually takes a lot of work for for her to do, and so. Oh yeah, you got to like organize all yeah. the shit. Yeah. You know, and anyone, anyone giving her crap for stopping this? Cut that out right now. She didn't have to do this for us, but she did it. It's very generous, and we appreciate her work. She is brilliant, and I hope that in some time in the future, she actually gets to work on the show proper, because she deserves to. Mm -hmm. Like a show ambassador or something like that, because she, she, her promotional skills are second to none. Oh, God, cat. <laughs> 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 Cat's just 
changed her pick on Discord to a Vervoid, and that's the perfect time to get out of here. Yeah, uh, yeah, let's, uh, hello my baby, hello my honey. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've had enough of, of, of uh, green me mothers from outer space to last me for one day. <laughs> I've had enough of them to last for one lifetime. So, so, Raniac, would you say that means you fed up with this world? <laughs> I, I hate you. <laughs> I love you too, Pooh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to the Classic Who Review, Terror of the Vervoids. I've been Rainy Yak, he's been Freezing the Furnace, and she's been Cat. Thank you for listening. Until next time, bye for now. Oh, actually, that reminds me. Um, patient. There you guys go. Bye. Excuse me. You guys hear that? Yeah, I you muted. What was that? I'm so sorry. I like had a gigantic belch just then. <laughs> Jeez. Can you pick it back I, up where I, you left I off? A, I have a soda, so I was I was just like it just. <laughs> like, I'm so sorry. God damn it, oh, cat! Will you stop eating and drinking things while we're doing this podcast? <laughs> I had a, well, I just had a steak as well as some fries this whole entire time. Oh so. fuck! That sounds good. Well, that's just gas central. Was, it was really good. No. I've got uh, sweet potato fries. Oh there. fuck! Oh my god! I love sweet potato fries. Oh, so that that is is amazing! <laughs> By the way, uh, top tip, Fred: if you ever make your own poutine, use sweet potato fries. Oh shit! That's a really it good idea. So good. That's a good tip. I, 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 you can't get sweet potatoes around. Can you? Uh, are you able to pick up back where you left off, Cap? Oh, oh yeah, we're doing the podcast thing. <laughs> You're doing the yeah, yeah, yeah. Cooking tips. Where was it? Oh, yeah. Uh, Leave the cooking tips in. Blooper reel. <laughs> tip for everybody. I am There's still technically a trained chef, so just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Leave Cut tips in. with cat. Good, good food yeah. tip for everybody. Back to the show.